Thank you all so much for joining us. Maybe we could just go down the line and everyone could introduce themselves really briefly. David Lang. Christopher Rothko. Kate Rothko Prezell. Adam Roberts. That was a very brief introduction. <laughs> Um, so before we dive into the music, I want to take a quick step back. I want to talk about Rothko Chapel itself. Mm -hmm. Rothko Chapel is what we see depicted behind us, um, and it's the topic of the last piece there. So what is Rothko Chapel? How did it come to be? Well, I can talk a little bit about how it, it came to be, just because being 13 years older than Christopher, I remember... Uh, meeting, uh, you know, the people who commissioned it in person and, you know, have some idea of what I think uh, made a connection for my father and why he decided to uh, go ahead with the project. I mean, I think, first of all, my father had probably been, you know, I think he did feel he had some kind of spiritual message, be it Jewish or non-Jewish, uh, to convey. I don't think that was really an issue for him. And I think the idea of being able to create that kind of space was incredibly important to him. And I think when he met Mrs. Dima Neal, who was a very, very spiritual woman in her own right, he immediately felt that connection with her and that this was going to be the space he wanted to create, uh, despite the fact that it was initially commissioned as a Catholic chapel. Subsequently, he some came something quite different. And I don't know whether you want to add something more about what you think the chapel is today, since you are so intimately uh, involved now. Sure, so he painted, he actually designed the interior and painted 14 large-scale murals that you see some of here for what he thought was going to be a Catholic chapel, but before it actually opened, they had determined to make it a fully ecumenical space, uh, open to all religions, and that continues to this day. We're about to celebrate our 50th anniversary, and what you see up there actually no longer resists, uh, no, no longer exists. The, um, we're, we're actually in uh, restoring the chapel, and that big black disc hangs down there with the, uh, the can lights on it, that's gone. <laughs> so it's actually going to be subtly but, but beautifully improved, much closer to what uh, my father had imagined for the space. I wonder if, you, if either of you has any insight into what um, the commission to build a Catholic chapel was like for Jewish artists or an artist of Jewish background. Well, I think, uh, I think because of Mrs. Demon Neal's personality, that probably did not enter in to his decision to make the chapel. I think had she been a different person approaching him, it might have been a very different reaction. But she was an incredibly open-minded woman, uh, you know, very interested in all the reforms that were going on in the 1960s in the Catholic Church, and very interested in all sorts of broader social justice issues. And I think for that reason, uh, I don't think it was an issue. Had it been a different person approaching him, uh, you know, I think he would have felt very differently, although he was certainly not a practicing religious Jew. He certainly considered himself Jewish, uh, nothing else. And uh, uh, I think, uh, I don't think Christopher mentioned, but the decision to make the chapel ecumenical was actually after my father's death. So he didn't even know about that decision, although I think he would have been incredibly pleased with what it's come to be. Well, you want me to weigh on in this? Okay. Um, so I think, I think the, the additional piece of this is, although maybe it would not have been his choice to do it in a Catholic chapel, um, the type of questions that religion asks, the, the big existential questions that is inherent to really any of the world's major religions, uh, those are the types of questions that his paintings are asking all the time, or that he is asking through his paintings. So the, the opportunity to paint for an explicitly spiritual space and to create a space where he is going to be asking those questions, um, it, was a, it was a great opportunity for him. He had long talked about wanting to have like little roadside chapels with a single painting in them where somebody could just stop and, and have that sort of moment. So here he has, he's, he has the opportunity to do that on a, on a, on a much larger scale. Uh, and I think he wasn't going to ultimately get too involved with how people were going to undertake that spiritual journey. He thought that he would be able to have his own sort of uh, I don't want to say influence, because I think it's really a very open-ended space, but he was going to be able to create a kind of space that would facilitate that kind of uh, spiritual questioning. Can I ask, um, did the reaction to the paintings um, encourage them to make it into an ecumenical space? It, was, that, was that part of the decision is when you see this, uh, 
it feels ecumenical when you go there. It feels like it's open to any kind of spirituality. I don't know in the sense that the chapel had not opened, so there was no public reaction yet. To closer to the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, closer to the mic. Closer to mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> In the sense that the chapel had not yet opened, uh, there was no public reaction to the paintings. But I wonder. If, I do wonder if it influenced Mrs. DeManiel. And unfortunately, I uh, never asked her that question directly, and I uh, don't know the answer. She certainly felt very comfortable with the decision because although she had planned the chapel for. Uh, well, actually, the current location of the chapel was technically part of St. Thomas University, which was her connection uh, with creating it. Uh, but she had no trouble with changing her mind about how she wanted the chapel to be viewed, if you will. So as, as we transition to the music, um, I wonder how this, this kind of, these ideas about spirituality um, both play out in abstract expressionism and, and, and in Mark Rothko's art more broadly, and then also how we hear them in the Feldman. Well, I think, um, I think Feldman actually, uh, I mean, he knew my father, they were, they were friendly. I think it's remarkable the degree to which he is able to express uh, aspects of that, of that space and how you experience that space through music. My, my, my sort of catchphrase for this is that um, Rothko's space is, is uh, expressed through Feldman via time, but that um, they're both, of, uh, in both cases, they are giving you a relatively blank slate. Uh, they're creating an atmosphere that invites that kind of contemplation, um, but they're not really dictating how, how that works. They're, they're making a suggestion rather than uh, a statement. Yeah, and I think, you know, my father certainly always talked about trying to elevate uh, visual art to the plateau on which he saw, you know, music residing. And I think the kind of philosophical and emotional, um, you know, message he wanted to convey, uh, you know, is very much felt in this space. And I agree, the more I listen to the Feldman piece, you definitely feel that reflection in the music. Adam and David, I know that Feldman is an influence in both of your work. Uh, I wonder, how, how do you think about spirituality in that Feldman piece? Well, Feldman is one of the most important composers to me, although I don't think his music necessarily translates into a direct in inspiration or influence on the surface of my music. My music is usually more active than Feldman's, as you could hear tonight, I think. Um, but in terms of a, a, a figure and the kind of intense spirituality, I mean, I think the, the word, the phrase for tonight's concert, the secular sacred, probably fits Feldman and Rothko to me, like a, a glove more than just about any other two artists that I can think of. They're both artists that create this incredible atmosphere of intense spirituality in their music to me without having really any uh, clear illustrative content in their work. So. Um, and also Feldman was a composer who was friends with all of these abstract painters and was an abstract artist, but his music also uses, I mean, I think this is, I'm just assuming this is a connection to David's music, but very clear pattern and variations on pattern and very clear notes and, and things that we can remember, unlike a, a Pollock painting or unlike a Cage piece of music. So he, he was writing abstract music, but he was also dealing with these incredibly clear cells and things that we can remember and hear, and even think we could even use the word motive to describe some of those things. So I don't know if I have, have a direct link to his, his work in terms of the surface of my music, but definitely in my, in my kind of own personal history, he's just a very important, his ethics and sort of his idealism and the spirituality and intensity in his music is something that I've always aspired to or felt very close to. I, I also feel like um, these Feldman pieces, which I love so much, they're really about um, your metabolism. You know, I, I think that when you hear this piece of music, um, this one, especially in the longer pieces which come afterwards, they're about um, changing who you are so that you can be prepared to hear something eventually that will come. So when you hear the tune at the end, which was a little childhood tune that he remembered from you know, his youth, 
Um, didn't know where it came from, he just remembered it. Um, I, I, I look at the first three quarters of this piece as something that changes us as listeners to prepare us to be able to hear something so simple and to have it mean so much to us. And I feel like that is sort of the way um, uh, the way art really works, you know, that you um, have to change yourself in order to um, be able to see something in it. And it's also the way spirituality works. It's something that you have to do for yourself. You have to believe that there is a value to um, paying attention to something before you can find the value in paying attention to it. Yeah, beautiful. Um, David, maybe we can talk about um, Little Match Girl. What is it mean to write a passion as a Jew? Well, you know, I, I, I am very nerdy classical musician. You know, I'm very nerdy, right? So I, I have a doctorate in classical music. I teach at Yale. I've been writing music since I was nine. I'm very nerdy, right? So my entire childhood, um, I sang in choirs, you know, I did everything that you do in classical music and a lot of Western classical music comes out of the church. So for, um, you know, for people who are raised as Jews and especially I am um, fairly observant. Um, so it's always really strange to spend a lot of time singing the Bach B minor mass or the St. Matthew Passion or the Messiah or all of these things which are, you know, kind of like the core works of the Western repertoire, and you realize there's something that you are interested in there, and there's some incredible commitment from the composer that you can get, but there's a limit to how close you can get as a Jewish musician. And usually what we try to do is we try to ignore it. We try to, um, to say, well, I'm going to write a choral piece, and I'll avoid that part of our tradition. I'll find a secular topic. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll not go there at all. But I just, I, I always wondered what it would be like if you could take the things out of the pieces that we love from Western music and make them more ecumenical. So my idea was to take um, the crowd scenes from the St. Matthew Passion, where the crowd observes the suffering of Jesus and uses observing that suffering to ask themselves how they can be better people. How does noticing this suffering make me a better person? And I wondered what it would be like if you could just um, keep the noticing of the suffering and take Jesus out and put someone else's suffering in. And so I took the Bach scenes, I, I took the text, I rewrote the text, but I didn't use any of the Bach music. And then I just plugged in the little match girl passion. So what they're reacting to is the Hans Christian Andersen story. So I, I thought it was kind of blasphemous, actually, to do it, you know. Um, and when it won the Pulitzer Prize on, on Fox News, it said, um, composer wins Pulitzer for taking Jesus out of the Gospels. <laughs> um, but, um, but I really meant it seriously. I thought, you know, what, what makes um, the suffering of Jesus so meaningful in Western music, you know? Is it that it's this one guy or the whole culture around this one guy, or it's just this um, is an example of people paying attention to the people around them. And maybe if that's what it takes to make something religious, then paying attention to anyone suffering could be religious. Adam, I wanna, wanna talk about your piece for a moment. Um, so we commissioned you with this program in mind and um, you had a very lovely response. Could you talk about your idea behind it and, yeah. Yeah, it was, Alex called me in November and thank you, Alex, for including me in this program. It's a great honor to be on it and I, I love both David's piece and I've known the Feldman piece for a long time and I've loved it. So it was really interesting to get called to, to write something. It's, it's not often that I get called to write something that has a, such a specific prompt and focus. You, oftentimes a string quartet will ask you for a piece or something and it's very open-ended. So to be thinking about both David's piece and the Feldman, which are, are very different in many ways. I mean, David's piece tells the story and, and sets a text, and the Feldman is textless and essentially just about sound and pattern and emotion and intensity. So I, you know, there were a lot of ways you could go in response to this. You could use a text. You could not use a text. You could 
right, a one movement piece or several. I mean, there were just a lot of things that could be done. And as I was thinking about what this project meant to me, I was thinking about my own heritage, which as I was a Jew raised by Jewish people who had essentially not really been practicing, but were very serious practitioners of, of meditation, of Eastern meditation. And so the idea of, of basically of some, of something being very, of spiritual intensity, but without kind of organized ritual was something that I was really thinking about. And I had just met a dear friend, Claire Schwartz. Is Claire here still? Can you please stand up, Claire? Because Claire wrote the most incredible poetry that I, I wish everybody could read this poetry. I think it needs to live on in a published work so everybody can read this. Because I went, I, well, Alex called me and, and said, would you write this piece? And I said, I'd love to, but can we do it a year from now? Because my wife was seven months pregnant with twins. And um, he said, no. Um, and so I said, okay, we'll, we'll do it. But um, I was terrified that I wouldn't be able to get it done in time or write the piece that I wanted to write. So I, was, we, I happened to be, I just moved to Ohio to take a job at Kent State, but I was visiting my wife back in New York, who is still in New York, and we had dinner with Claire, and I said, Claire, um, I just got this commission, and I have to write this piece by April. Would you write some poetry for me? And she said, sure. Actually, I didn't, I didn't tell her that it was due in April yet. And then I said, well, can you, can you give me the poetry, like, next week? And she said, sure. Um, and I said, well, why don't you, could you please write something like, and I just threw these words out there, like, feminist psalms that don't use the word God, that are secular, but kind of the length of psalms. And I didn't even really know exactly what I meant, but I said these words to her and she said, sure, and, and um, ended up writing these absolutely incredible, she wrote five psalms, essentially, and she sent one a week, very religiously, and um, so I, I, I started writing the first piece before I knew what the rest of the text would be, and it ended up just being this incredible uh, set of works that I just I thought were perfect for this. Um, they're, they're both abstract in terms of the language, but they also basically tell the story of the Jewish people through very beautiful abstract language. And then the, the fifth movement is um, I, it's a lullaby that doesn't have any text that I dedicated to my, my babies who are still unborn at the time. And so that was kind of, it, it comes right after the sacrifice and before the, the last movement, which is titled Invention of Prayer. So I, I thought it was sort of a moment of rest before the last movement. And I also just wanted to write that music when I was thinking about being a father. So, um, so yeah, I mean, when you have a text like the one that Claire sent, it made my, my job much easier. Because when you have a work that you're responding to that you love and that's just bringing so many things up in you, I wouldn't say it's automatic, but there's so much to bounce off of, so, yeah. Oh, it's a beautiful piece. So my final question for tonight, and it's a very difficult one, is, is Mark Rothko's work Jewish? Are the works that we heard on this concert Jewish? What is at stake when we ask that question? Or what insight can it, can it offer us or can it not offer us? Why is everybody looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slightly dodge the question and hopefully circle back to it. But I, I, was, I was thinking about the question that's sort of posed by the, the, the idea behind the program and talking about a secular response to, um, uh, you know, a, a secular response to sacred questions. And, um, and, I, and I was actually wondering, I said, I was wondering, is in fact uh, the Rothko Chapel, is it, is it a secular, uh, is it a secular place? And, in, and especially, is Feldman's music, is it in fact secular? I mean, it's not, it's not part of the ritual. It's not, it's, it's not, um, uh, it, it's not something that is, uh, you know, part of the canon in that sense. But is it, in fact, a secular piece? What, what makes something sacred or secular? So, um, you know, again, my sister quoted my father talking about wanting, uh, wanting the viewer to have the same religious experience that he had uh, painting it for them to have the same response when they're, uh, when they're viewing it. And I don't think he meant religious with robes and books and specific songs, but I think he did mean that sort of inner, inner spirit that, uh, that gets hit by religion, gets hit by, by music, and, and that he wanted his painting to do the same thing. Uh, whether that's specifically Jewish, I think, uh, I think he was willing to use whatever means he could find. His experience was certainly Jewish, but he had certainly moved away from Judaism as a, as a specific practice. To me, there's something Jewish, perhaps, about the kind of experience that I feel like is common to both artists, Feldman and Rothko, which I feel like there is something to me in common. And that, that's something, there's something about 
both artists encouraging a sense of contemplation, an extremely subtle feeling that in, in encourages not only a sense of contemplation, but one that really takes time. When you look at a Rothko painting, the longer you look at it, the more you become attuned to these subtle gradations in color and feeling. And the same thing happens with a piece of Feldman. Now, Feldman in his later works can make you go through this experience because if you listen to a piece like Phil, for Philip Guston live, it's four hours. And I've actually performed that piece. And if you actually listen to the whole thing in real time, which nobody really does, but if you do, um, it, it, as David said, it changes you. It, 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 you actually go through many states. It's like sitting through a Buddhist retreat where you go through boredom and agony and, and exhilaration and all of these things through this four hours. It's not just about these, the, the musical materials. It's about what happens throughout that whole process. And, and while when you look at a painting, of course, nobody can control how, how long you look at it, I think that a Rothko invites you into that contemplative experience more than many other work, kinds of work do. And I don't know if there's something, I don't know if that's Jewish or not, but I feel like the act of contemplation through subtle feeling, there's something Jewish about that to me. I don't know why. Yeah, I would add to, I, I, you know, if you ask me, did I think my, my father during his lifetime thought of himself as a Jewish artist? Um, I would answer no. I think he thought of himself as Jewish and an artist. But as Judaism, has, as I've become more and more involved with Judaism, to some degree the rituals of Judaism, as I've grown up since the time my father died and thought back and tried to decide whether there were Jewish elements in my father's art, I think, in a, in a sense, uh, following up on what Adam says, I've concluded the same thing. There is something about um, the emotional response he is looking for in the viewer, which I think is uh, typically Jewish in some ways. There is something about uh, the fact that I think my father's decision to become an artist was really a philosophical decision. It was not a decision, I am gonna go out and create an aesthetic piece of art. It was a philosophical decision that he felt he had a message to convey to people that he thought he could best convey through visual art. And obviously that image evolved over time and I think he didn't feel he had accomplished that mission till he really broke through and created his work uh, from the 1950s on and particularly when he created a space like the chapel. And you know, when you pose that question, I was also thinking of the fact that my father was often spoken, uh, often spoke about his desire for the viewer to act, interact very directly and intimately with his paintings. And he often discussed the fact that he did not want to use perspective in his paintings because he felt that that gave the viewer a more intimate interaction with his paintings. And there's something also about that kind of interaction, about the ability of the individual to react directly uh, with their, res their own response to the painting and perhaps look inside themselves and think that they may be reacting uh, to something higher than them, something spiritual, which I do find uh, Jewish as I think about it um, over my lifetime. I have no way to answer that, I think. I mean, I think that we, um, you know, we are all Jews making this work, so, you know, what, who we are gets into it, you know, but I, I've been trying to think of you know, the, to me, the, the principal Jewish aspect of this is the chutzpah of thinking that, um, that we would have something to add to this culture, which is a thousand years of anti-Semitic, you know, um, music from people who didn't like Jews. And somehow we feel like, oh, yeah, we have something to add in that world. Or, you know, oh, yeah, sure, I'll take the commission to do work for a Catholic chapel. Sure. You know, I, that seems really Jewish to me. Um, you know, sh I can write White Christmas, sure. Um, so, and I think that, um, you know, desire to sort of be, um, be um, in th the general culture and observing the general culture at the same time, I think that that's probably um, where our um, background gives us our greatest um, strength and our weirdest problems. <laughs> Thank you all so much.
a, a shameless commercial plug. Uh, if you've not been enough of uh, Rothko Chapel tonight, my choir, or I, the choir I sing with, is performing on June 9th at St. John the Divine, the Rothko Chamber Chorus. So if you feel like you're just beginning to wrap your head around Rothko Chapel, you need to hear it live again. Three weeks, uh, June 9th, come hear us.